G'day and welcome to the third installment of the Improving Blender series. In parts one and two, I went over the eight fundamental laws of usability. And in this video, I'm going to put forth my proposed solutions uh, to those problems. Um, so I do understand, first of all, that UI proposal videos do put quite a lot of people on edge. And I completely understand that because I feel the exact same way. So let me just start by saying that this video is merely a suggestion for how we could possibly improve Blender. I'm not forcing the idea at all. Um, I have no right to change Blender's interface whatsoever. So it is merely just a suggestion. So with that out of the way, let me start with a question that you probably have right now. Do we really need a new interface? Can't we just keep what we have currently, but improve it? And yes, actually we can. In fact, that's what this proposal is all about. Uh, this proposal isn't one of those throw out the code and start from scratch kind of things. Um, this is merely a reskinning of the functionality that we already have. Um, so all the core functionality, all that kind of stuff can stay the same. Um, really, this is just a, a way to improve upon what we already have. So with that said, Let's go over a few reasons why a new interface for Blender might be a good idea. Reason number one, Blender has changed. When the interface of 2.5 was designed, it was designed with the internal renderer in mind. But within about a year of its release, Cycles came onto the scene. And it started off as a bit of a novelty, a cool new renderer with impressive results. But it's gained in popularity and is now at the stage where developers are talking about making it the default renderer. But the interface was never really designed for Cycles. So the developers have had to try to fit new functionality into the existing interface, but obviously it was never really designed for it. So the interface has this sort of bloated feeling to it. Lots of buttons, lots of scrolling, and too many choices for the user to think clearly. By designing a new interface, we can think clearly about how to make the new functionality as easy to use as possible. Reason number two, it's restricting development. The current interface is already so overloaded with buttons, panels, and features that developers are nervous about adding any more. But that means that new ideas have to wait. There are some really good ideas that we can all agree on, but they're getting shelved because there simply isn't enough room for it. Like a layer manager. There's already an add-on for it, but we really can't fit it in without making things even worse. So new features are being put on hold until we can find a way to include them. Reason number three. It's not task orientated. Good software will allow you to flow from one task to the next without breaking your train of thought. However, when people have to refocus their attention on their tools, it is pulled away from the details of the task. This shift increases the chances of users losing track of what they were doing or exactly where they were in doing it. Now, Blender actually has a huge advantage over other software as we can do almost an entire project without leaving Blender. It's pretty impressive really, and no other software can really match this. However, the unfortunate downside to this functionality is that switching from one task to another can be quite a jarring experience, often requiring you to completely change a layout and the size of your panels to suit. For example, let's take the task of sculpting. You really only need to focus on your model, but the gigantic properties panel and toolbar take up a good 46% of this screen space. So we go full screen, right? We hide the toolbar and we're away. Until you realize that you want to use the multi-res modifier. So you bring back the buttons, you go to the modifiers and you add it. You do a bit more sculpting and then you realize that you could really use a textured brush. So you go to the toolbar, then you go to the properties panel, then the texture panel and you add one. Later on, of course, you need to increase the multi-res modifier levels. So you bring it back again, back and forth, back and forth. So understandably, this becomes tiring after a while. And many of us are guilty of just leaving all the panels open. I'm sure I'm not the only one that's had the realization that they've just spent the last half an hour working on just a tiny portion of the screen. So the bottom line is Blender's current interface just isn't task focused. We have a lot of functionality, but it's spread out into different panels and submenus. With a new interface, we can rethink what's necessary for each task and then bring those tools to the forefront, alleviating the stress and confusion, as well as allowing users to work faster. Which brings me to my proposal. So after four weeks of talking about it, let's finally get into it. The first major proposal idea is the implementation of tabs. 
Tabs are a way to give each task its own work area and provide all the tools necessary for that. At first, it may look unusual to see all the buttons at the top, but since we all have widescreen monitors now, we can actually fit a whole lot more functionality lengthways than we can vertically. This eliminates the problem of scrolling. Now, I know that not everyone is a fan of tabs, but if implemented well, they can actually be one of the least confusing parts of the interface. Tabs are one of the few cases where using a physical metaphor in a user interface actually works. They're so visually distinctive, they're hard to overlook. As interface devices go, they're clearly a product of genius. Another proposal idea is drop-down menus. This can be used to hide the rarely used functionality, but still make them accessible. This can give Blender a cleaner look by not cluttering the workspace with functions that may only be used occasionally. Now your next question may be, what happened to the properties panel? Well, with this design, we actually won't need it. Every single button and function from the old properties panel can easily fit inside the header. My next feature proposal is the sidebar. Now, although this rests on the right-hand side, it's actually completely different to the properties panel. So don't get them confused. The sidebar is designed to help users understand their scene and interact with it better. The first panel we have is the notifications panel. This is where Blender can display its error messages. And it's a solution to a problem that Blender's had for a while. Currently, error messages appear underneath the user's cursor and are hard to spot. But with a dedicated notifications panel, users can easily see errors that have occurred. Next is an info box. This box will normally be empty, except when an action or an add-on presents options to the user, like when you're adding a sphere, for example. Now, previously, this was hidden at the bottom of the toolbar menu and was pretty awkward to use, especially for new users. By having it clearly on display, users can access it easier and are less likely to miss it. Next is a properties box, which is of course the information of the current selected object presented as simply as possible. And underneath that is something I'm super excited to show you since I know it's been in demand forever, a real layer panel that allows for naming. Blender's current layers don't allow naming, which becomes a problem when you have really large scenes and can't remember which layer has which objects. By allowing users to name their layers, it eliminates the guesswork and allows for faster usability. Another exciting possibility is a history panel that displays the last actions performed by the user and allowing them to easily backtrack. This eliminates the problem I addressed in part two, whereby users can be scared of using undo as the fear of going too far back can mean losing their work. And another really cool possibility of the sidebar is that it could change depending on the task. So this is what it looks like in the 3D viewport, but in the render panel, the sidebar could be used for displaying render slots, as well as a render info panel, telling the user how long their last render took. So that's the sidebar, a place that allows users to better understand their scenes and a place for developers to add more functionality. The next feature to propose is a new toolbar. The most notable feature is that it's four times smaller than the current one meaning that we can leave it open without losing so much screen space. The new toolbar also offers navigational tools and common actions, which are helpful for new users as they can hover over them and learn their shortcuts. But in regards to the programming side, I'm not 100% sure how this will happen as Blender's cursor state never really changes, but it's just an idea that I'm throwing out there anyway. Okay, so I've explained some of the main features of the UI. Now I'll give you a quick demonstration. Let's say you have a scene like this and you wanna give the floor a new material. You simply click the materials tab and you're now presented with an array of options along the header. On the far left, you have the custom button for advanced users who wanna go straight to the node editor. But for everyone else, on the left, we have a list of commonly used shaders. To the right of that, something exciting, material presets. And then on the far right, you have your most recently used materials. In this case, since we wanna make a custom wooden floor, we're going to use a mix shader, which combines diffuse and gloss, probably the most common material type ever. So once that's selected, all the other options disappear and you're now presented with two easy sliders for adjusting the amount of gloss and the sharpness. Your next choice is to choose color, image, or procedural texture. In this case, we want to use an image texture. So I'll click image. Once the image loads, I'm then presented with a new array of buttons and functions which are commonly needed for creating materials, like the mapping type, the scale of the texture, very handy, and something really cool that I think has a lot of potential. 
the ability for Blender to automatically take the original image and use a grayscale version of it for the bump and specularity maps. It's something that a lot of users do anyway, but having it done for them saves them a lot of time. And for anyone that doesn't want it, they can of course just delete it. In this case, I actually have my own custom bump map that I'd like to use. So I'll click the change button, and then from the drop down menu, I'll choose new image. And that's it. The material is now pretty much done. I can tweak the values if I want, but in this case, the material is finished. In barely six clicks, we were able to create a realistic wooden floor material that would normally have taken upwards of five minutes to achieve. Now let's talk technical. How would this work exactly? Well, it would actually work in the exact same way that using materials currently works. In fact, this is what inspired it. When you make a change over here, it's actually adding and adjusting nodes in the node editor. This design does the exact same thing. The only difference being is that I've taken the most commonly used functions and made those the most accessible. Now let's get onto rendering. When we go to the render panel, you can see that we have every function from the old render settings clearly on display in the header. But you'll also notice that the stills and animation settings have been separated, which eliminates lots of clutter. And down here, we have a nifty little preview of our render. This is made possible with the highly underrated and underused OpenGL renderer that we already have in Blender. Since OpenGL renders in about a second anyway, we could make it render automatically when you go to the render tab, giving people a quick preview of their finished scene before they perform the real render. So once we're ready, we hit render and we're now presented with a pre-render breakdown. This informs the user what Cycles is doing and most importantly, how long till it starts. This was in reaction to the feedback from the survey, whereby 94% of users said they'd find this information useful. Once the render has started, we're presented with a helpful progress bar and an approximate time till completion. This lets users know if they should make a coffee or do the laundry. And one really important feature, a physical cancel button, removing the need for that escape key button mashing that I'm sure we all do from time to time. Now, once the render's finished, this is where it gets interesting. We're taken automatically to the post pro screen. Now this is an entirely new concept that I think will speed up experienced users workflow and also help new users understand how nodes work. Basically, you can click from any of the adjustments above and drag them onto your work. I thought this would be handy because there's been countless times where you finish a render and you just wanna add a quick vignette or a color adjustment, but jumping deep into the compositor can break your focus and be really time consuming. But for experienced users who want to get straight to the node editor, they can click the full compositor button. Now for the last topic, I'd like to talk about mouse functionality, or AKA the most debated topic in Blender history. Now in part one, I propose making left click the default for selecting instead of right click, based on the usability law of familiarity, essentially boiling down to the fact that all computer software today uses left click, so why don't we? In the poll I did after the video, 82% said they were in favor of left click. However, I do realize that polls are not definite and I did only present one side of the argument. The suggestion soon sparked quite a bit of discussion online, to the point that I almost wasn't gonna mention this next part, but I think it's an important usability idea, so I'm gonna mention it anyway. Now, for the sake of illustrating this next concept, you'll have to forgive me for referring to left click as the default for selecting. But again, this is just to illustrate the point. So if left click is select, and we then made placing the 3D cursor something completely different, like control click, we then have a whole button free, which for this proposal, I'd like to suggest adding right click menu functionality. See, Blender has a lot of hidden functions that are only accessible by remembering their shortcut, which is understandable for a software as complex as Blender. However, many of the shortcuts are used for one specific task, like converting a curve to a mesh, which is Alt-C, or changing a handle type of an F-curve, is V. Now, all of this is fine. Once you've learned the shortcuts, you can work faster and all is well. My proposal is not to change that, but I think there's a problem when a shortcut only works for one specific task, like switching the primary camera to another, which is Control-0. But in other parts of Blender, this shortcut really has no use. So learning, recalling, and using this shortcut for the rare time where you want to switch your camera to another is a burden for not only new users, but for existing users too. If we could utilize right-click menus for tasks like this, we could allow users another way to perform the task that doesn't force them to know the shortcut. 
Another important point is that the menu could change depending on the task. So for example, let's say you're in edit mode and you have a gap in your mesh, but you can't remember the shortcut for creating a bridge. Blender could observe that you have two separate edge loops selected with equal amounts of vertices. So you probably want to create a bridge. You hit right click and at the top is bridge. Or another example, if you select two meshes, it could predict that you probably want to join them, create a group or parent one to the other. Little things like this would make it easier on newcomers, as well as giving existing users something to fall back on when they can't remember the shortcut. Now Blender has something similar to this already with the W key, but the menus are often too long or too short, and they're not very intuitive to the user's actions. But the biggest of all is that it's completely foreign to most users. Right-click menus just make sense. We already use them in almost every other application. So having this ability in Blender would just feel natural. It could also be used for learning. Like if you're in the node editor and you've spotted a node that you've never seen before in your life and you wonder how it works, you could click right-click, what's this? In seconds, your browser opens and takes you to the appropriate part of the wiki, telling you exactly what the node does and how to use it. This would give users quicker and easier access to the wiki and also allow new users to feel guided whilst learning Blender. Another important use would be cursor-dependent tasks. And by that, I mean the multitude of tasks that can really only be performed when the cursor is next to the subject, like the extrude tool. Everyone knows that you can hit E to extrude the region, but there are multiple types of extruding. If you use the toolbar to change the type, your cursor is nowhere near your mesh, so the action is awkward and it restricts the movement. Or if you use the search function, your focus is now on typing the right keys than it is on your task, which slows you down. With a right-click menu, your cursor could remain next to what you're doing and perform quicker and easier than the previous methods. So a right-click menu could benefit everyone. It could help existing users remember obscure shortcuts, it could help new users learn Blender's functionality faster, and it would allow developers to add new functions to Blender without feeling guilty about hiding it behind yet another mystery shortcut. So that's it for mouse functionality. Now, I do realize this adds a lot of friction to the left click, right click argument, but I really do believe it could help everyone to use Blender. But again, this is just one guy's opinion. And finally, before I finish the video, I did promise to release the results from the polls in parts one and two. So here we go. Number one, asking to save. In the event of accidentally closing Blender without saving, 96% of Blender users were in favor of a dialog box asking them if they'd like to save. Number two, crashing. In the event of Blender crashing, 94% said they would prefer a dialog box asking them to recover their file instead of having to understand how to do it themselves. Number three, design. To improve the visibility of wireframes, 79% were in favor of making them a whitish gray color instead of black. Number four, readability. 79% were in favor of increasing the font size to at least 14 points instead of the current 11 points. Number five, undo. 87% were in favor of changing the undo functionality to be chronological instead of mode dependent as it is currently. And number six, tooltips. When hovering over values to see their descriptions, 84% said they would rather not see the Python code. So there we go. Lots of controversy and lots of things to discuss. Now, understandably, there's probably going to be some things that I've mentioned that you disagree with, and that is totally fine. I understand. As a member of an open source community, it is your privilege to express your opinion. However, as I've said before in the last videos, I'd like to encourage people to please be respectful to others whilst commenting. Uh, and on the topic of UI debates, I'd like to finish with a great quote from the book, Don't Make Me Think. I usually call these endless UI discussions religious debates because they have a lot in common with most discussions of religion and politics. They consist largely of people expressing strongly held personal beliefs about things that can't be proven. The right kind of question to ask is, does this function with these items and this wording in this context on this page create a good experience for most people who are likely to use this software? So if we can focus on that question and leave personal opinions and emotions out of it, then I think we can have a lot more of a constructive conversation together as a community. So that's it. In one week from now, I am off to the Blender conference um, where I'm sure there's going to be even more usability discussions. So um, we'll see what happens after that. 
Um, but in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Take care and see you later. Bye.